normal Ghanaian actually has no idea the amount of freedom they have. Really? Until you move out. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I feel restricted here. Interesting. I feel trapped. Movements and, and beats mm-hmm. that are ingrained in their DNA mm-hmm. that come from Africa. Mm-hmm. The reason we like beats and strong beats and things of that nature is ingrained on the mm-hmm. So What you see in America mm-hmm. is a birth of a culture that is them trying to find the culture that is in the DNA, but mm-hmm. they're not aware of. Mm-hmm. In the UK, mm-hmm. it's flex being African, knowing where you're from. Mm-hmm. So the first thing, so in the UK, for instance, if you're a black guy, they ask you, what's your culture? Mm-hmm. And they say, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Nigerian. That's what it is. Like, it's, we, it's a badge of honor, bro. Mm. Like, mm-hmm. I see. So that's the difference. Yeah. For me, this whole concept of going to hell because you don't know the Bible doesn't exist. Mm. And I do not see the African religion as being black or evil or, or dodgy. Like, every single religion, yeah, it can be used for good. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with African spirituality. Do you, if that's what works for you. I was just asking her, like, the, the same people that you complain about that are racist, you have a picture on your wall of a blonde haired blue-eyed, white god, and you pray to him five times a day on your knees. And, you know, she slapped the hell out of me. <laughs> right? But- Hello, guys, and welcome back again to another amazing episode. And this is the Diaspora Podcast, I guess. <laughs> uh, we're back again with another video. We do hear, uh, sorry, we do have here some amazing personalities. They all relocated. Uh, don't say you're a Ghanaian. I'm not relocated yet, but I'm Ghanaian. You're a Ghanaian? Yes. So, but we do have some amazing personalities here. So I'll let them introduce themselves. I'm Hayford. Uh, what's your name? This is Moonboy, Van Jossi Diake, Moonboy, right? My name is Francis Quinn. And Emmanuel Tokumbo Dako. All right, so we're going to have a, a quick dialogue about, you know, transition, you know, moving back. Um, what, why did you decide to leave the U.S. behind um, to relocate? You are Nigerian, actually, yeah. but you didn't go to Nigeria. You came to Ghana. Yeah. We had a one-on-one conversation, but for people watching, why did you decide to do what you did? Yeah, for, for me, Ghana made a lot of sense because I had connections here, and also Nigeria seems a little bit, you know, they had the light situation that's, that's a little bit off. And uh, Ghana seems to be, for me, in the next 10 years, to be one of the top major cities in, in Africa, too, as well. So that's one of the reasons, too, as well, why I moved. And, uh, yeah, mainly the connections, too. And I like the chill, the network, the network. And I like the chill, more relaxed vibe. You know, Ghanaians are like the chill version of Nigerians, you know. So <laughs> that's, that's why I decided to, you know, oh, go yeah. ahead and draw. And Kui, why Ghana, man? Family. To learn the history, learn about culture, learn about where I come from. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I just said also opportunity. Uh, I'm planning on business in all of the countries in Africa. There's a lot of other really great countries out here, but Ghana is basically the gateway mm-hmm. to uh, experience in other parts of Africa. Mm-hmm. There's a big part that was fun and about my family in history. I like that. And uh, Imano, yeah. you, you've been traveling everywhere yes. Kenya, Rwanda. You are on the continent, you know, but where would you say you are based? I'm currently based in the UK. In the UK? Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I've been in and out, um, even though I live primarily in the UK for now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all come back, right? So I intend to come back in the end. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. um, You know, actually, I never really thought Accra was lit until I left. Really? (laughs) When when was the first time you, you came to Accra? What, right, what so year? This is, okay, so I have Ghanaian parents, but okay. I was born and raised in Nigeria. Okay. So um, I did up to junior secondary school in Nigeria, and mm-hmm. then I came for senior secondary school, um, the best secondary school in Africa, Presbyterian Boys Secondary School, Presec Legon. Interesting. Yeah, I have to mention that. You, this guy wants to fight. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, so I had to come to Presec Legon. Yeah. You know, Presec Legon. And mm-hmm. then, um, <laughs> and so, I mean, when I came... Um, I mean, normal Ghanaian and enjoying yeah. Ghana and those things. And I started traveling and then Nairobi, Kenya was my favorite city in the world. Mm. I used to like Johannesburg as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, Nairobi remains my first favorite city in the world. But then mm-hmm. when I eventually moved out of Ghana mm-hmm. and I went to Europe, then I realized that actually Accra is lit. Really? And I was like, oh my God. What, what makes Accra lit? See, it's the vibe, the atmosphere, the things you can get. I mean, the freedom, like, mm-hmm. you wouldn't understand. You think, um, the usual, the normal Ghanaian actually has no idea the amount of freedom they have. 
Really? Until you move out. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I feel restricted here. Interesting. I feel trapped. Like You mean in the West? Yes. Okay. Bro, when you're here. You guys agree. You I see you're nodding your head. You can't, you can't explain it. You can't explain the kind of freedom you have in Accra. Yeah. You, like, it, it's not tangible. But it's just there in the air. Explain it in a way that the audience listening and watching what is So there. this is what it is. Um, I, was, I was mentioning this to um, Vandross the other time. Mm -hmm. um, before I moved to the UK, I lived in Paris for a while. And um, so there was this day, mm -hmm. um, I was driving on the highway. Then I got a flat tire. Mm. Um, somewhere in November, cold weather. And in Ghana, yeah. when you get a flat tire and you park by the roadside, you can just easily go and call Vulcanizer yeah. and get it sorted. People will stop their cars to help you. To help you. I stood, it was 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. in Paris on the highway. I tried to get to a safe zone and then I got down in distress, visibly distressed. Nobody stopped, not a single soul. Mm. You couldn't call anybody. You couldn't get a vulcanizer. That's a Saturday night. Now, instead of people stopping, they rather call the police. Huh? Yeah, 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 yes. And then the police came, <laughs> towed my car. I sat in the towed car, and then the guy drove me to the closest bus stop. I was going to drop my car there. Interesting. And I had to tell him, okay, I'm going to see somebody. Can you kindly drop it? Mm -hmm. My friend's house is here, so it's a bit closer. So mm -hmm. please drop it there. And then mm -hmm. right there, when it was done, brought us his POS machine. I should pay 120 euros. Interesting. Yeah, it's not for free. Towing you. <laughs> yeah. Had to pay for being in a dire situation. Mm, which is ridiculous. Wow. Something like that would never happen no, here. No, it never Ghana. happened here. You get someone to help you. Mm. You know, mm. sorted. And you go home. So a sense of community. We sense do have of community a is not there, right? So um there are some things you don't I mean here, before you I mean you can always talk it out. Yeah. Talk out any situation, talk to people. I mean, it might seem slow, but once you know who to talk to, it moves mm -hmm. fast. But there... Yeah. Mm. I, I see Quay is also nodding and saying, you agree? I was agree. Um, it's funny because I started to, um, you know, say we're driving back to, uh, to uh, Frankfurt. Yeah. We're in the city of Prague. Mm -hmm. And we hit the, you know, the motorway, right? And a lot of traffic. And I look to my right, I see people driving their cars and bikes on this dirt road. your life you mean at one point sometimes Your heart, yeah. your heart jumped. Yeah, nah. Actually, when I see an officer in uniform and naturally I feel like, oh yeah. shit, something about to go out. Yeah. But he's like, nah, he ain't going to get out of the car, get out of the money, he's back on the road. So yeah. Like, okay, cool. Interesting. So it's, it's a freedom, I forget exactly what he said, where, and when he said trapped, I resonated with that 100%. Mm. Like, I really felt trapped in the States. Mm. My situation was a little different because I had a legal situation that maybe. You physically couldn't leave. Yeah. Wrong. 
You don't pay your yeah. taxes on time. You don't do this. There's so yeah. many things that your brain is constantly processing and juggling. This bill's coming out. Mm. I'm not paying for getting evicted. I'm going to do this. I got late fees. Yeah. Student loans. This. That. If I do a break this law, I got court coming up. No, it's too much. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> Just switch that up a little bit. We have a table here now. Now go ahead. Uh, yeah. So for me, w one thing, one word that I can describe Ghana as is peace. Mm. And I feel like you n you don't get that kind of peace in the West. Like when you're in the West, it's you're stressed. You know, a lot of people like what Quay was saying. You're chasing bills all the time and etc. Another thing too as well is. You step into a room, you look around, you take a fresh breath of air, and just. Mm, you don't have that in the US. Every, everybody looks like me. Oh, okay. Everybody looks like me. Mm. You don't feel this sense of like, oh man, you know, I'm like the token black guy. Like I need to act a certain way. I need to conduct myself like, a certain. Oh, way. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Like you don't feel like that. Like everyone is just oh human, human, <laughs> human. Mm. You know, and I think this is a huge, huge difference too as well, and um, also the. The fact that in, for instance, I can speak about the states. I've been to 20 different countries, but I'll just talk about the states mm -hmm. and just living there. I think there's a lack of cultural identity in, amongst the African Americans there. Mm -hmm. Like they don't care to know that, you know, where they come from. They don't seek to know anything about Africa, a lot of them. And uh, Africa is just now recently starting to be cool, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a cool thing. Um, probably before Afrobeat started emerging in, in the mid 2010s. Like when Drake was, you know, dropping the controller with his kid and so on. So I think before then it was still seen as kind of lame mm -hmm. and just kind of weird. And then the Black Panther came out and accelerated that too as well for people to have a little bit different level of understanding. And uh, that's another thing. Yeah, I know you hate, <laughs> he hates the Black Panther. <laughs> when you uh, say a lot. lame means like, when you say lame means like uncool or what? Yeah, yeah. Lame, uncool just not interested in it and um yeah they also make it very extremely hard to integrate at least like back in the days i think it's more easier now but because they have access to the internet so internet changed a lot of stuff because people didn't know anything about africa other than what they were fed through a gateway mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it was just one and so we didn't learn about african history too as well and i'm, I'm telling you right now if african americans knew about african history there'd be an influx of way more african americans here on the continent, but they don't teach us that on purpose because they know if we unite mm -hmm. as one, that's basically the end of Europe. Europe goes back to a wasteland mm -hmm. because then we trade amongst each other. Elaborate on that. Elaborate on that a little bit, and why it's by design that we we don't you know kind of yeah. work together. So. Well, it's, it's it's obvious that um, colonialism didn't end, right? We're in this neo-colonialism type of state right now. And it's this kind of elephant in the room that nobody wants to address, but that's just the reality of it. You see some countries starting to rebel now, like Burkina Faso and Niger, Mali, and so on. But the countries in Africa are still controlled by the West because the West implemented this fiat based system that basically only lets them allow to be in if they meet certain rules. Right. And even if they get in, they get different rates than other countries that are outside of Africa. So the IMF, for instance, are charging 30, 40, 50 percent, you know, so that they get liquidity loans. to be able to, yeah, loans to be able to build up their country. So all of this is happening um, and a lot of people aren't paying attention to it. But if the diaspora was here, maybe then they would bring their skill sets and they would stop giving these contracts to foreigners like France, like China, like, you know, and et cetera, that's here getting these contracts that we should be getting to be mining our riches that we are entitled to because we are from African descent. So, yeah. Yeah, I want you to speak on the freedom factor a little bit. Um, you know, our brothers said that they feel more free here um, in Africa, Ghana, than they would in, in the U.S. What would you say to them? Absolutely, bro. Like, it's not even, <laughs> it's not even close. Like, the stuff I see him doing... <laughs> <laughs> Every time I'm just like, you know, I, I get to a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there a speed limit? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, ask, I ask if there's a speed limit. And I, I learn really quick that it's like, oh, okay, you just kind of, it's yeah, just yeah. there, but it's not, you don't follow that. It's just, you know, <laughs> it's a guideline, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I just think the level of freedom here is different. And this is how I think, I think society should be more like this than putting so much pressure and stress on, you know, citizens. And I think in the West, this is something that, you know, a lot of people that aren't privy to when they go over there, Africans that go over there, 
they think that it's all sun, sunflowers and rainbows. And the reality is, you're going to go over there to go slave for somebody else's dream. And you're not going to have time to do anything and enjoy life at all. And that's wow. just how it is. Have you, have, you had, have you heard Africans say that African Americans are lazy? And the reason of them saying that is you do have access to other systems in the U.S. Um, and they just come from so-called less privileged society. There's no better education or what not whatnot they come to america and make millions of dollars where african americans are living in the street when you hear something like that what do you have to say to it? i would say that african it's very nuanced right because african americans they basically built up america mm -hmm. and they a lot of them feel entitled to not having to work so hard and be able to also leech a little bit from the system i think it's something also quake can maybe speak to too as well um about the the psyche and um also you're kind of conditionalized to think that oh, because I'm black, is, is the excuse they use that you can't take and leverage certain situations to be able to uplift yourself in society. And um, yeah, when foreigners come there, they just see like, oh, wait, I can actually like go through this process and actually really get a job afterwards. Like they're just like, oh, wait, like the school system actually kind of works to an extent to where I can leverage this or these, these government programs work like this is all new, you know, and I think um, African Americans, I think that they also have been conditionalized too as well because of the marketing from the, the cultural marketing of hip hop, mm -hmm. I think plays a huge role um, too as well. But I think it's something Quake and also, you could also jump in here and speak yeah, into yeah, that too as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and we, we actually talked about this on our last conversation, but you know, the truth of the matter is that um, you know, African Americans have been through a lot. Mm. It's been a lot of, um, it's been a lot of things like intangible things that you might not see on the front end. Yeah. Um, and we might not recognize the impact of uh, going all the way back from like the Willie Lynch letters in uh, slavery times where there was literally letters that was written by a slave owner in I believe, Haiti mm -hmm. who found a way to basically break the psyche of a black slave and in a way that it would perpetuate from generation to generation. So mm -hmm. things like um, taking the strongest, most ambitious of them and mm -hmm. punishing them in ways that was excruciating but making it very public for the rest of the slaves to see mm -hmm. tying one side of them to a horse and the other side of them to a horse and separating the horse so that mm -hmm. he made his wife and kids and everybody else watch uh, say they say what was made to, made to watch that so there's things like that that they did and they implemented going all the way back from then to specifically mess with the psyche of black americans so when you have something like that where you're showing that when you have uh, someone who is rebellious or someone who is willing to stand up and, and be a little bit more outspoken, this is the, the result that you're going to get to in the fall line. Then you go, you move up into times where black people were extremely industrial, mm -hmm. where they built up their own community. Back in the 20s, when you look at images of black Americans in the 20s, they were dressed in suits, mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. Like it was very common, mm -hmm. like they had suits, and you don't care if you were a 12 year old, you out here with suits, it was very common yeah. then, right? Yeah. And they had their own things, they had their own doctors, their own lawyers, they had their own industry. And you white Americans saw that shit, it was like, no, we're not going for that, right? Mm -hmm. And they implemented things specifically to work against that. And black Wall Street in Tulsa, mm -hmm. Oklahoma, they literally inside a riot, knocked the entire thing down, built a train right through it. We had, they had all that. Mm. Same thing in Philadelphia where you have black Americans who were trying to become self-sufficient on their own. Mm -hmm. The United States government, the only time the U.S. government has ever bombed its own citizens. Interesting. Was black people in Philadelphia, the black, the move bombing, they, they firebombed an entire row of houses from the move organization. And as the people were coming out to escape the fire, they shot at them. I'm talking about even kids. Hmm. And they don't talk about that, they don't teach us that history in school. They, and the crack epidemic, the crack epidemic was massive. The black America we talk about today, hmm. as black people being ghetto, this and that, that is a recent development as of the crack era. Prior to the crack era, in the 60s and 50s and things like that, black people were working. You, know, you, you talk to the average black American, their grandfather was working in a factory, their grandmother used to take care of the house, they raised like eight, nine kids. They, Come from decent households. They weren't ghetto, loud, da, 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 quote unquote lazy. That came from the crack epidemic and the development of project buildings and things of that nature. So there's a lot of it when we talk about these things. Now, on the flip hand, you have Africans and, and people who come from other countries mm -hmm. into the United States. I've been talking about them in the last conversation. Mm -hmm. 
these are people who are industrious. If you find a way to make it out of your country of origin, mm -hmm. to make it to the United States, you have a certain hunger, a certain fire, a certain eye for opportunity that yeah. the average person doesn't have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have a certain amount of chutzpah. Mm -hmm. you know yeah, yeah, you yeah. Have balls, you yeah, have balls, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that individual is going to have, he's going to be looking at everything as an opportunity and he's going to be putting his best foot forward because he ain't got another choice. Mm. Whereas the people who are, right, you might find that they're already there, they've been beaten down, et cetera, so they've learned to accept certain conditions mm. that they've been forced into. I see. And then mm -hmm. you talk about having certain programs like, I'll give you another example. When I came over prison, mm -hmm. I was trying to put my life together. Mm -hmm. My girl at the time had a baby on the way, right? Yeah. Very typical statistic. I had every black American statistic. I did this saw the drive, I went to jail, I had the baby, I did all of it. So I, I so I lived that experience too. Mm -hmm. And my you know, so and my girl, she at the time my my, my son's mom, we were trying to figure out how we gonna make this work. I'm trying to find a way to get a job, but we need to survive. Yeah. Okay, go go get the you know, tannin, food stamps, whatever. Mm -hmm, whatever. Mm -hmm. In order for her to get on that program, mm -hmm. to get the benefits that they have, yeah. to help with the kids and stuff like that, I cannot be in the house. We really? We live in the house together. What? Yeah. So that you have to be what? Homeless? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you have, have to, to be a, a single mother, yeah. Oh, so I see. In order for you to, to get state assistance for a lot of times, you cannot have a two-parent household. So there's, there can't be the father in the so house. So it's designed, mm. instead of it being in a way where it encourages two families to come together, let's mm -hmm. tell we can assist you all mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. it's, oh, he's in the house, you can't, you, you won't get a Interesting. So she had to go to her dad's house, mm -hmm. use her dad's address, get the, what you call it, and then come back home. But if they found her at the house, in my house, in the time, she would lose this. Mm -hmm. So it's stuff like that that people don't see and don't know. Mm. When, you know, you see people from outside talking about, yeah, well, that's amazing. So mm. There's a lot more to it. Interesting. Okay. Can, I, can I just, I know, I know Emmanuel probably want to, but let me just, because the psychological conditioning, right? This is another thing that I just recently, it's a recent development that I just, you know, um, discovered, right? So when we went to, me and Emmanuel went to Cape Coast, mm -hmm. right? Because I had to see like when the beginning of all of this started, right? You know, I went to Cape Coast and I just had to analyze everything, be as perspicacious as possible. and. One of the things that really stuck out to me was how the posts were designed, right? Mm -hmm. They're designed so the slave captives were in a dungeon below mm -hmm. and directly above was a church. And so while the slaves were, were pissing and pooping on each other, crying for help, they were looking above, listening to the praises of their new God, which is a blonde haired blue eyed white mm -hmm. God, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is another part of the conditionalizing because they took those same slaves after they've already then programmed them, after they raped their women and et cetera, through the land or through the door of no return. They then ripped them from their name and their tribe and et cetera, and then it gave them to then the slave master who then had his last name, and then they took the name of the slave master. And you were no longer who you were before. You were not part of the Igbo tribe, the Yoruba tribe, the Shanti tribe. Yeah, so, and the spirituality, they gave you that you will praise and get on your knees for a blonde haired, blue eyed, white God, right? And um, I think they used the fact that Africans were very spiritual against us too as well. And uh, so they came, you know, tried to spread their Christianity and say like, you know, our God is bad. The, the, the God that's good is that blonde haired, blue eyed, white God. And um, I think this is part again of that conditionalizing kind of where it, where it started from, you know, and how it continued, how he was describing from, you know, stages in different um, centuries and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But I don't know, if Emmanuel, if you had something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, yeah. Deep. Yeah. That was yeah. deep. I, 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 I want us to, like, for example, why do you think we, we think that we are, Africans sometimes are better than African Americans living in America? Because we go there and we become often very successful yeah. than the average African American living yeah, in America. Uh, thankfully, I've never lived in America. Lived I mean, you swear. No, I've been. visited America. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, so that's the mentality that um, black Americans are lazy. I've heard that being said many times. And when you look at what Quick said and what um, Vandross says, mm -hmm. it's psychological, it's systemic, basically. The sort of, how do I put it? Um, create systems that's mm -hmm. encouraging them to be lazy mm -hmm. based on, I mean, slavery times and all of those things. So, I mean, I really can't say much about it because mm -hmm. I've never, never really lived in America. I mean, you, then, you live in the UK. How, what was it like in the UK? So, you know, in the UK, they're not, now, most of the black guys in the UK know where they come from. Mm. So, draw that contrast. So, so, so that's the difference yeah. between, the, so, the black, no, so, 
I didn't got to understand the psyche of the black American when I had the black American friend in Paris. Mm -hmm. So this, so after having conversations with him, I learned that they taught them nothing about Africa. Mm. They don't know where they come from. Now, mm. there's a different kind of black man. Now, mm. look at this. If you're a black man in the West and you know where you come from, you have a different kind of confidence. Mm. I see. The kind of confidence I have, because I know I'm from Ghana. Mm -hmm. Worst case scenario, I come back to my country. Mm. I know where I'm from. Mm. I know my roots. Mm. There's difference for the guy who does not know where he comes from. Mm. He doesn't know, okay, he's from Ghana, he's from Nigeria, he's from Sierra Leone. He doesn't know his ancestry. He doesn't know his language. Only what he knows is English, right? So he doesn't know his great grandfathers. He doesn't know that we're great people. I know where my great grandfather comes from. Mm. And I know I'm a fucking warrior. Mm. You understand? Mm. Excuse my French. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a different kind of confidence with which you move, mm. right? So as I told Vandross, especially let's say you grew up here before going there, you probably don't need any form of validation from anybody because I know I'm there. I know I'm trying to achieve. Mm. But then. It's a different thing if the, the child is raised, born and raised there. Sometimes, because of the kind of system they have, they need some form of validation from the Western society, mm -hmm. from a different colored human being. Must, oh, when I'm moving through Europe, I really don't look at anybody's face. Mm. Mm. You have a mission. I don't care. Mm. What, I've never had issues <laughs> of racism. I'm not even looking at your face in the first place. <laughs> I really do not care. <laughs> if I have no business with you, I'm not looking at your face. I only have look at your face when we have business and we deal on the mutual grounds. I do not deal with other races who are not intelligent enough to know that I'm also mm. at par with a level of intelligence. Mm. Right? Because I know where I'm from. But then the black American, on the other hand, mm needs to know where he's from to be grounded mm. to get some confidence to know mm. that okay even without the u.s i am mm. yeah mm. And i want to say this to that too like, that's, you guys really have a really 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 strong point like the black people in the uk and when you look at the triangle triangle slave trade yeah the slave trade, they left the U uk and europe they went and picked up slaves from different areas in Africa. Africa. Mm -hmm. the Portuguese, the Dutch, Senegal. English, everybody went and they took mm -hmm. groups of people. They might have went to Senegal, took a whole tribe from over there. Yeah. They might have went to Ghana, took a whole group of people from there, like families, mm -hmm. entire neighborhoods. And they went from there and then they went to Brazil. Mm -hmm. Africa. And the slave owners were in Brazil, these were wealthy people. These are people who left their, their country to start businesses in those places. So those people who have money mm -hmm. are able to purchase the entire, give me the entire group of these people from this area, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. they have certain conditions mm -hmm. because of where they naturally come from that would be good for what we got going on in Brazil. Mm -hmm. I'm a sugar farmer, a sugar cane farmer, so give me the ones who are naturally from the sugar cane region. I'm a this farmer. Let me give you, so there's certain traits that they were looking for. Then they left from Brazil, they went to the Caribbean, mm -hmm. and they dropped off certain slaves all up and down the coast of the Caribbean. The people in America, the whites in America, were outcasts mm. from the UK. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They left there not because they were wealthy with the opportunity, mm -hmm. but because they were criminals looking for religious freedom. They were getting persecuted, so they were poor. A lot of them who came to the U.S. I see. The same way Australia was mostly criminals mm -hmm. who got sent to Australia as a punishment. Mm. The people who came from the, the, uh, from England to the Americas were people who were poor. They were trying to figure their own shit out. Mm. So by the time they get to the U.S., the U.S. is the last stop. Mm. So basically you had remnants of people from this person might be your woman, this person might be your con, this person might be this. They can't talk to each other. Even in Ghana, how many languages you got in Ghana? Yeah. Like six or seven yeah. in this one region. Mm -hmm. So people couldn't really even communicate with each other. They didn't have the same culture. They didn't mm -hmm. have the same illness. So mm -hmm. people in the U.S., black men in the U.S., the reason why it's so different from Brazilians, I say, Brazilians know their culture. Mm. Brazilians know their religion. They, they have religion that they can't mm -hmm. It's Ifa. It's yeah. Nigeria. It's yeah. Puerto Ricans, uh, Dominicans, all these people in the Caribbean, most of them are Europe, the Jamaicans, most come from Ghana, the Khan people, right? So they're, they, they're more culturally in tune. Yeah. Whereas the people in the United States have it, zero. It was erased from. They, they, they have, the, the culture that you find in mm. America is ingrained in the DNA. Mm. The twerking, the mm -hmm. dancing, this is movements and, and beats mm -hmm. that are ingrained in their DNA mm -hmm. that come from Africa. Mm -hmm. The reason we like beats and strong beats and things of that nature is ingrained on the mm -hmm. So what you see in America mm -hmm. is a birth of a culture that is them trying to find the culture that is in the DNA, but mm -hmm. they're not aware of. Mm -hmm. you see what I'm so mm -hmm. that's the difference I feel like with black Americans. Mm -hmm. like you saw about people in the UK, they know where they come from. Mm -hmm. I'm Nigerian. I'm yeah. Nigerian. Mm. Yeah. There's no black 
man in the UK where doesn't know where it's coming from. Yeah, but, but then in, even in this modern day, come from. in this modern day, you try to convince the average, um, not average, I mean the, let's say someone in Bronx in somewhere in the, the ghettos projects, mm-hmm. and you, you, you try to tell them they're African, they'll tell you they're not African. Some, no, Like no, some no, of no, them, no, no, like, you know, I mean, I've, I've had people, I no, personally actually, had an encounter. Probably where that guy, was maybe 10 years ago, but mm, not today. Not today. So, today, so, 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 there are not that so, many, so, though. So it's not, because today, it's like 70, 30 now. Being African is flex, bro. Mm-hmm. 30% will acknowledge that they're African. 70% will still... Yeah. Really? Yeah. It used to be like 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, good, yeah. a good example so, is Floyd Mayweather. You know, because right. he was uh, asked like, you know, are you African? He's like, I'm, I'm not. African. I'm, I'm not American. I'm American. He's like, you know, I'm not American. He's like, I'm American. He's like, you know, I'm American. He's like, you're African. He's like, I'm not African. I'm, I'm American. He's like, I grew up here. This is who I know. This is all yeah, I know. Yeah. Yes. So there's, there's plenty of them like that. And I, if you just... But, but, but then that's the, okay, that's the difference between the UK and the US. Because in the UK, mm-hmm. it's flex being African. Mm. It is flex. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so it's flex knowing where you're from. Mm. So the first thing, so in the UK, for instance, if a black guy, they ask you, what's your culture? Mm-hmm. And they say, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Nigerian. That's what it is. Like, it's, we, it's a badge of honor, mm. bro. Like, mm-hmm. I see. So that's the difference, yeah. Uh, moving a bit from that topic, I mean, talking about you guys all identifying opportunities um, in Ghana, Africa, and, and capitalizing on that. I had few people in my comment section saying they would rather live in their studio apartment in New York than to, you know, move back here. Um, you are into crypto. Yeah. You trade cryptos. Yeah. You help other people. You're making money, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You've, you've made money in the system. He is into uh, stock trading. He's, he was literally helping people make money while well, before the interview started. Um, you've built your, your career and, and still saw that there's opportunity down here and then you move back here and build in here. Most people are watching and they're like, I don't think there's anything here for me. And if they're watching, what would you say to people like that? There's, there's three notable sectors that I see visibly that just hits you in the face like, oh, whoa, like construction, like engineer, like stuff, stuff in that area, manufacturing. Address the mindset before the opportunity. Yeah, I would say the Ghanaian, uh, they're more laid back. Like, that's another thing I noticed, too, because I've hung around a lot of Nigerians. Nigerians are very, like, we don't care about risk. <laughs> we don't care. You know, we see the risk and we jump after it. Whereas a Ghanaian, he's more laid back. He'll wait for you to take the risk and then for you to hire him. Like, that's, that's how I, I kind of get that kind of psyche and mentality. And um, I haven't worked, like, you know, with Ghanaians, but... I don't know if these, these, this stuff is true or not, but I've heard from other diasporans that they, um, it's, you got to monitor them a lot mm-hmm. because they can get, yeah, because they can get, like I noticed that too as well. Like if I go to a restaurant, like one time I went to a restaurant and the guy's texting on his phone. He's like, oh, I'll, I'll be there in a second. He's just chilling on his phone for like five, 10 minutes, stuff like this. So <laughs> for the person that doesn't want to come here, it's just that they're ignorant <laughs> at the end of the day. It's just blatant ignorance because how can you know if you like something if you haven't step foot on the ground yet you haven't tried it you know it's it's so for me i I would say it's just blatant ignorance and if you want to stay ignorant then fine you know go ahead and stay on the titanic while it's sinking you know but i think here is is actually africa in general is for me the land of opportunity because this this is what we were talking about yeah we were talking about this the other day yeah I'm for me. I'm confident that the Titanic is sinking but, because it just matters. Yeah, you know the funny right? thing. Yeah, when, yeah. I met, when I met Van Dross in London, yeah. and um, he had this epiphany to come back to the continent, he wasn't too sure though. He was always battling back and forth. Am I sure? And I was like, bro, come on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Be on the ground. It's yeah, a difference yeah. between. And I told him though. So his intention was to shop around the continent and decide where to probably settle. He's come to our credit, already decided to settle in, in, in Ghana. That's true. It's true. I will say this though. Mm. Like, everybody is entitled to their own thing. opinion. I will say that even in first generation Africans, mm-hmm. there is a, another uh, issue of first generation Africans who leave Africa to go to the States. A lot of them don't want to come back yeah. either. Yeah. When you really? tell you come back, they're like, That's wow. true. Yeah, for what? Mm-hmm. What That's is true. that for me? Because mm-hmm. not everybody cares about opportunity. Mm-hmm. Not everybody cares about cultural relations. Some people's desires are different. Mm-hmm. Right? Some people want certain types of lifestyle and certain things. And some motherfuckers just want to be near white people. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We don't. But there's some people. <laughs> 
Am I lying? Like, older Africans, they carry that British mindset. British, uh, older Ghanaians. Africans, actually, older generally. Africans, yes. Because his, his parents are Nigerians. Yeah, Nigerians. Nigerians. They, they have the same mindset. They, they have the same yeah. mindset. They have that br- 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 British mindset, British mindset. yes. Mindset he's, like, he's, right. White he's right. He's right. Yeah. And, was, and so and even wow. them, they have gotten need to get reprogrammed. I have an uncle who just, he built, he built like five houses in Tema, different communities in Tema. He came back for a little bit, maybe like two years ago. He came, uh, went back to the United States. We're like, what happened? He's like, oh, I don't need to do The stuff that he was used to in the States, he didn't want to deal with here, yeah, right? Like the I medical see. system, mm-hmm. and there's the slow this, the slow that. It's people peeing on the side of the road and shit like that. He, don't, he, didn't, he, he wasn't desired that. Mm-hmm. My dad, another one, this nigga, he, to get to <laughs> he would go to Nigeria, because my sister is in Nigeria, but my sister in Nigeria, she's like very wealthy, and so the experience that he has over there, it's insulated, yeah. you know, everything is insulated. He got 50 different drivers and butlers and this and the third. But the true experience of living in Africa, he's like, bro, he, he would rather live in Switzerland or somewhere like that, anywhere that's European, and that's his mindset. Why? I, there's a crisscross happening. I mean, for the interviews that I've done, like you are moving from the U.S., yeah. right? If we should go to the the average community here, I mean, let me ask my videographer. If you get a chance to go to America, where you go? No, <laughs> because you've listened to the interviews a lot. <laughs> but the average Ghanaian would would trade. You see, <laughs> and why why do you think that is based on your own observations? The grass is always greener. Right? Like everybody thinks the grass is always greener on the other side. Yeah. So like at the end of the day, you know, everybody here. And again, what what you ask yourself, what is it that draws people here? Yeah. What drew us here? Mm-hmm. Opportunity, yeah. freedom, this, that, and third. Well, at 60, 70 years old, that's not what's important to them. What's important to them is comfort. Hmm. Right, they 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 have the point. freedom that they want. They don't. They're not going to break any laws. They don't need to drive on the side of the road. They don't care about that stuff. <laughs> they care that you know everything is going to be ordered and structured and blah blah blah. So I mean, you know, that's just what it is. Like now let's talk about the church in the slave dungeon a little bit and how the church now, not just during the slave era, but then after that, has been brainwashing the people and and all right. Yeah, who want to speak this, on yeah. that? So, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me i believe in spirituality mm. i believe in a god right um it's very important as a human to know that there's a supernatural being that there's supernatural powers even you yourself as a human you're a god yourself mm. you could meditate and speak things into existence and they mm. happen but then you can't tell me that my forefathers who lived before the missionaries came to africa before they brought the white religion went to hell because they didn't know the bible that's weird ridiculously those of us here on the continent i mean those of africans are way much more christian than the missionaries or the westerners who brought christianity because hardly will you see someone in northern england where i stay going to church yes yes mm. yes it's, 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 it's true hardly yeah i was shocked you see someone in northern england go to church but then every sunday 90 percent of christians in ghana go to church they don't open their shops they, they don't yeah. down. some people are just christians on paper in the west most people most actually people. have no religion they do not know the bible the way you quote the bible philippians blah 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 all this thing. they don't do that then. but then they're just good humans that's what matters yeah. so for me this whole concept of going to hell because you don't know a bible doesn't exist mm. and i do not see the african religion as being black or evil or, or dodgy like every single religion yeah, it can be used for good yeah there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with african spirituality mm-hmm. do you if that's what works for you mm-hmm. use whatever you have for good and not for evil mm-hmm. and then i believe in reincarnation <laughs> even though i'm a christian on paper and as i said <laughs> But I also believe in a supreme being that does not punish you because you're not Christian. I do not believe that. I've, I was raised in everything in the church, but I do not believe that that's the only way to have a better life after here. Do you think we getting sucked in? Do you think we getting sucked into this type of religion is making or impeding growth 
and development yes. in this nation. So I believe that one of the things that hindered Africa's growth is the fact that most people believe in some magical, miraculous, spiritual thing to happen to you without putting in the work. Mm. Right? They believe, okay, I will pray instead of going to work, putting in effort. Expecting I would expect miracles, expecting magic to happen. Mm. Because that's what this religion teaches you. That, oh, don't do too much. Just do a little and then pray to God. It will happen. Mm. So therefore, limiting your potential. When the potential requires a bit more work, fine. You need to have maybe pray and believe in a supreme being. And because sometimes serendipity happens. Mm. Most of the sometimes it's not just about your work. Sometimes it just happens. But then... You need to develop to a certain point whereby your chances of being lucky increases. Mm, mm. Because the more work you put in, the more lucky you get. Can, it's not can, about praying and going all the time. I, yeah. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to add something here too as well. So I grew up in the States, right? And my mom, super huge into Christianity. And because I was very, again, perspicacious as a young kid, I was always observant, always asking questions. My parents would always like get mad at me for asking questions. And I was just asking her, like, the, the same people that you complain about that are racist, you have a picture on your wall of a blonde haired mm -hmm. blue-eyed, white God, and you pray to him five times a day on your knees. And, you know, she slapped the hell out of me. <laughs> right? But, you know, interestingly, slapped, actually, you know, um, and, oh, I'm sorry about it. You know, it's... it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I never, I never understood because I was just always, I never drank the Kool-Aid ever in the States, never. Like I saw right through what was happening. I never fed into the media marketing machine. I was like, this is just one aspect of what they're saying. But I was like, I got to go outside and go get my own vision of how the world looks and not what they're telling me inside these walls. And I think that even now to this day, it, it makes me a bit, you know, it, it sucks, you know, seeing, seeing that you can't speak to your mom about this. And she's not going to have an open mind about it. But I saw how damaging it was um, and how unproductive it started becoming, you know, um, to, to do what she was doing, you know. And just, again, like he said, expecting magic, you know, from praying on your knees to a white god that something was going to happen, you know. And um, I think it's psychologically ingrained in us to be like that. I, I want to say, say also, I think, I think Christianity was the worst thing, the absolute worst thing that happened to Africans history of everything mm. that has happened to Africans. And I'll say that the reason why <clears throat> is because, you know, they say judge a fruit by its tree, mm. right? Or judge a tree by its fruit. Right, right. When you come into a country and the people there are peaceful living their lives, mm -hmm. they have their own system of governance, everything is, they're very peaceful people. And you come with the Bible at the end of a gun, murder, rape, everything that happened with slaves, they would pray over the slave ships as they sent them off for people to be murdered, killed, jumped over hmm. and things of that nature. And then you come into the country and you program and brainwash the people there to worship you. Hmm. Then I, <laughs> the reason why they give you Jesus as God, I, I was in a crowd mall yesterday yeah. and this girl came up to me trying to start talking to me about you know, helping her with the Christian group and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. I had a good conversation, everything was cool. Mm. But she asked me, do I believe in my Christian? I said, well, I believe in God. Mm. She said, well, what about Jesus? <laughs> I, said, I, 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 I don't know. About Jesus. I, I don't know. He's a man. He's a man. <laughs> well, you know, well, Jesus is God. So what, what's the problem? He's saying, I worship God. Why is it so important for me to follow Jesus, the man, mm -hmm. if you want me to believe? The reason is because we have a face on it. The face looks like their face. So psychologically, every African and every black person, every person in the world who follows Christianity mm. worships white people as God mm. without even realizing when you close your eyes and you say, <laughs> imagine who's God. Mm. Close your eyes and draw me a picture of God. What does he look like? Mm. Most people are thinking white, white, weird, white robe, in a, in a, he's laughing because he just did. <laughs> angel. What does an angel look like? White. And you know the fun, and, 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 and the funniest thing is mm. Lucifer, who was the archangel, the number one angel, was thrown from heaven to hell mm. and was black. How then is the archangel mm -hmm. black? Mm. And you assume that the rest of the angels were white. Mm. Because it's exactly. and, and that's what makes it so fucked up. Doesn't make that, sense. And this is the thing about Nigeria, mm -hmm. right? And what I actually follow, I actually practice African spirituality. Mm. Well. Okay. And I, that's my actual mm -hmm. practice. Mm -hmm. And I started in the States mm. as part of my journey from Georgia also. 
But in Ifa, you have a different ratio. They're angels, essentially. When they're depicted, they are depicted as black people. Mm -hmm. Assume the original of beauty and, 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 and love is black woman, beautiful black woman. Shango, the king, the, the you know, statue, muscular, mm -hmm. black man, or woman, god of war, mm -hmm. etc. Black. Mm -hmm. So when you start to now see these different, not only do you see people that look like you, which is important, <coughs> mm -hmm. and when they tell you it's not important, tell them to go change Jesus and turn into black. Mm -hmm. and Actually, you never do it. Mm -hmm. In a white church, you will never yeah. see black Jesus with woolly hair ever. Mm -hmm. So imagery is important. Now, when you when you carry that mindset of okay, this is the different spirits that you are uh, engaged with, right? And they're, they you know, come from your cause, from your understanding. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but they're also masculine and feminine. Mm. In Christianity, they take out the feminine element. Mm. There is no, except for the Virgin Mary, who they kind of look, look at it as like, okay, she's cool. Her whole achievement was giving birth. Yeah, to Jesus. Right? Um, none of the disciples were important. Mary Magdalene was an important disciple. Mm -hmm. The number one favorite disciple of Jesus. But they took her out and made her a whole. Mm, right? mm. So they take out the, the feminine element, which is very detrimental to the psyche of all people. Mm. Then, which is why you see so many people confused in the West, trying to become women. Gender fights. Mm -hmm. The feminine element has been repressed in Western society, so now it's making a comeback in mm -hmm. terms of men now who believe they're women, women who don't know they're men. Everything is fucking confused mm. because it's it's unnatural. The religion itself is unnatural. It does not follow God's natural laws. Mm -hmm. Of how things are supposed to be expressed, which is why every culture in the world has their own form of spirituality that involves spirit, God, mm -hmm. first, well, a single God, overall great uh, element, mm -hmm. sub deities that have interaction with human beings that you can petition for things, you can do things with, you can ask for that energy to mm -hmm. achieve things, and we all have innately in us. Mm -hmm. Every person carries the energy of Ogun, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. When you get into a rage element, that's yeah. Every person sees beauty in life, that's so true. Mm -hmm. We carry all of these elements with us. So our natural spirituality is the same, same across all. Mm -hmm. You go to uh, um, China, China yeah. got the same thing. Mm -hmm. They have their overall God, they yeah. have different Buddhas underneath. Mm -hmm. You have, go to India, India has the Hinduism. Yeah. Everything is the same mm -hmm. thing, but they have different cultural things. And that's how the human being has to operate. When you take that away and you try to force something that's unnatural, you're going to have problems. In Interesting. Africa, it's expressed itself in terms of mm -hmm. black people in Africa who cannot do for themselves, mm -hmm. where they look for European mm -hmm. uh, outside influence to make something happen. Mm -hmm. and, and if it doesn't have European element, it's looked at as a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It will always be looked at as a let, let me ask my videographer one question. There's four cars, right? One is made in Japan, one is making, <laughs> made in China, <laughs> one is made in Italy, one is made in Ghana, right? Three of these cars lasted for, um, let's say, one of these cars lasted for 70 years. Out of which country was that that, that car made from? Probably, probably Italy. If well, not probably Italy, what? If not Italy, what? Japan. If not Japan, what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, waiting when yeah, Ghana yeah. is going to so come out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so automatically, yeah, yeah, yeah. if it's made by a, a Western, um, you know, society, we believe it's the best in its quality. If it's not, I mean, it's, it, we should throw it away. Um, and you, as a child, having an independent mind, you and you telling your parents that why are you praying to this white person, questioning it, and you get slaps. What would you say to maybe somebody going through that at that point in, in, in at this you know moment in his life, questioning everything, and their parents trying to still beat them into it? The one unique nuance that I didn't have that is available today is access to internet, mm -hmm. right? And easy ease of information flow, right? That's the main thing. Right? We live in the age of information technology. So if you're a young kid and you're suspicious, you're perspicacious, you're you're thinking more on a high level of consciousness, there's, you can always use the outlet of the internet to be able to access information and find different sources to see for yourself what the truth is. And then when you get old enough, you can then you know, take whatever capital you can save and go venture out and travel. I always, I always encourage people to travel. I've been to 20 countries. I was so, I, I, didn't, give, I didn't care about anything else at, as a teenager than leaving the US to go travel because I just didn't believe it. I didn't believe that Every other place is poor and destitute. They didn't just say Africa. They were saying like every other place is like secondhand, 
to, to, to the U.S. They make you believe it. They like ingrain in your head and I just refuse to believe it. I never drank the Kool-Aid and I was like, I'm gonna go venture out and go see it myself. And then what I found was everything they said was false. So how can then I believe the media? So I stopped believing the media from a very young age. I started looking for a different source of information and also when I was connecting with people, they would be from different parts of the world and then I could get information from those people when they were back on ground in that location. And then until the information started picking up on the internet, I was able to then get more information from the internet. And another thing that helped me too as well was um, I didn't fall into the matrix trap of social media. I actually haven't had you know Instagram, Facebook and so on since 2014. Uh, I have LinkedIn now and I do podcasting just because of business but I'm just not on the internet because I could see how it can be very unproductive for you and you can get a lot of false misinterpreted information because you're letting the information get fed to you and you're not going to go seek the information yourself. Let's talk about the misunderstanding or the fights with, with, within our community as black people. Um, the male fighting the, the female and we disrespecting our women and mm -hmm. where that social media plays part in that. I mean based on what you just I, I look at the, the United States as a huge media machine and influencer there too as well. I think that's part of the reason too why the African American influence was so much more depicted globally than any other African diaspora community. Because there was other stuff happening in Brazil, there was stuff happening in the Netherlands of, of, from black people, there was stuff happening everywhere, but the African American influence I think grew to the entire world. So when you look at like old movies of, you know, living in the ghetto, you know, uh, paid in full and et cetera. So this was kind of like the depiction of kind of how families are supposed to kind of operate and how mistreatment of, of, uh, of black women, you know, um, kind of started. And also, again, with the hip hop culture, it was always mistreatment of, of black women from the lyrics that they were spewing. You know, it gets into your head like, oh, this is how I'm supposed to treat a woman. I'm supposed to call her, the, you know, the B word. I don't want to say it, but <laughs> I'm, supposed to, I'm supposed to call her out of her name. I'm supposed to not treat her well. Um, she's basically overly sexualized. You know, I think this is where this, this sort of programming started, but I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, with the black, with black women and black men kind of debates and things of that nature, it, mm -hmm. I think it goes back to what I talked about earlier. When you have a, a culture that is suppressed the feminine energy, period. Um, then it, it expresses itself in that way, where the women are so used to being subjugated and being you know, looked down upon, mm -hmm. that it now starts to come back in a more aggressive way. The mm -hmm. women now are going to look at me masculine, right? Where you now have a woman who has to be head of household, you have a woman who has to go out there and pay the bills and do all this stuff. You have men who don't know how to be masculine themselves, because they don't know how to deal with the femininity inside of themselves. So they try to repress that. And then that comes out as them being overly emotional, overly uh, um, hyper-masculine, mm -hmm. because they're trying so hard to, they don't know how to deal with the feminine energy within themselves. So what ends up happening is, um, you end up with men who like don't know how to have conversation and deal with civil disagreements. You have men who don't know how to um, deal with the feminine energy in a woman. Mm. and how to nurture that and how to give that space to grow. So what you're seeing is the uh, the, the, the evolution of mm -hmm. a people because they, have, they no longer have that, they don't know how to deal with that. But you go into other places around the world, men are more, uh, you know, it, not everything is gay. Right? Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you see guys that they might hug or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't do that shit. In the state, yeah. I, shit. I know some Europeans, they, they kiss each other on the cheek and stuff mm -hmm. like that. It's like normal. <laughs> We don't do that shit because it's, we're in a society where it's like very hyper-masculine and we don't, we don't even know how to process our own emotions a lot of times. Like the first time I had, I shed a tear like in the past 15 years was just like two days ago. I wow. My, 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 I didn't know my, my uncle had a grandchild mm -hmm. um, and I just met him in the, in the area that they're from and he's asking about his, and he's my favorite uncle. He died when I was in prison and never got to really mm. um, grieve him. And, um, and it just it made me tear up. I haven't cried for 15 years. Interesting. And I'm like, damn, what the fuck is wrong with this? <laughs> <laughs> but it's because we have this situation where we don't know how to really tap into that. So now you have men and women there who are constantly at, at each other's throats because women also don't know how to really tap into the feminine, which is why black mm -hmm. women keep on being accused of being 
uh, overly aggressive, mm -hmm. or overly hostile, because they kind of have to be. Like, if they're not, they get mistreated in the workplace, they get mistreated uh, at home, they mm -hmm. get mistreated in the streets. So they have to kind of put on this armor, because mm -hmm. the world is hard out there. So if you don't have a man that's there to be that mm -hmm. guy, you now have to be that. So now you have a man, a woman who becomes a man, and men who are fighting not to not be women, mm -hmm. and now you have them arguing. So even the fact that it's even argued about, yeah. It shows that men are being more feminine. Like, mm -hmm. what the fuck am I saying? Yeah, about I give it. <laughs> about a woman. Yeah. Or whatever. Like, let them think whatever they're going to think and move the fuck on and go mm -hmm. to someone productive. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, these conversations are so dumb and they're so, uh, it, they're so useless. But it, 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 the guys who are out here trying to be alpha mm -hmm. are the least alpha niggas yeah. on the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's, it's mm -hmm. overcompensation. Mm -hmm. It's a little dick energy. <laughs> I like that. Um, Imano? I mean, I've been, I, I'm not sure I've some experience. I mean, when it comes to um, men and women mm -hmm. conflict, um, I guess. You can talk about the family structure and how yeah, so, Africa so, is I mean, different. So, luckily for me, I mean, um, probably didn't grow up in America, so I don't have the same mm -hmm. experiences as they have. Mm -hmm. Because here, we don't really have i don't i'm not sure if we really have um, men and women conflict no. not much but then we know okay there's a family structure where naturally the man is sort of like the head of the family yeah where the woman is the assistant sort of but still at the end of the day we all we all know in a proper family the mm -hmm. woman is actually a power broker that's very true and the man, the man is a face yeah. mm -hmm. but the mm -hmm. woman is really the power broker so mm -hmm. if so one thing we are getting wrong as some of the african women are getting wrong mm -hmm. is the fact that they are beginning to copy situations happening in the West mm. and trying to apply it here, but that's not what happens here. Mm. Mm. Who really calls a woman here the B word? We don't do that here. Right. Not as much as um, maybe I don't really live here anymore, but then I'll say here because we don't do that here. We don't do that in Africa. Yeah. Nobody calls a woman the B word. Mm -hmm. No young man would disrespect an elderly woman mm. because that person can be your mother. Yeah. Right. So we don't, we have some amount of. Even in Ghana, it's a, it's a, even though we think it's patriarchy, it's a matriarchy to an extent because it's our motherland. Yeah. That's how we do it. Mm -hmm. Most Akan homes, it's matrilineal heritage. Right. Yeah, that's very true. Mm -hmm. Right. So the woman holds a high key. Most chiefs in Ghana, in most places in Ghana, I don't know some places it's patriarchy, mm -hmm. most chiefs are appointed by women, mm -hmm. by the queen mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's some reverence given to motherhood, to mm -hmm. womanhood. Mm -hmm. So that is there culturally. Even in places in Africa where it is patriarchal, mm -hmm. there's still the place for the woman. Because we all know that, in truth, before a man makes a move in a family, the wife must have a say before, in that yeah. That's mm -hmm. how we as Africans are brought up. Mm -hmm. But then because black Americans were taken there, their culture was wiped from them, they could not trace back some of these things, some of these elements of Africanness mm -hmm. with them. Thus, we are seeing it manifest in modern worlds where the system is trying to take out the black man from his home, thus making the situation so that most families, most black families in the West do not have men mm. there. Mm. But we don't have that situation in Africa. Right? So there's less so anyone who has a conflict between men and women in Africa is manufactured. Mm. It is not natural. Interesting. All these feminism things in Africa is manufactured. Right? And as much as okay, the systems might look like men have much more opportunities or whatever it is, but in truth. You and I know that the woman's feminine power is stronger than the man's. Mm -hmm. mm. When a woman, you and I, meets a policeman today, mm -hmm. there's a high chance that the woman would get away easy. Than <laughs> in Facts. Easy. Yeah. <laughs> so we respect women. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's how it is. Mm. But then, to tell you how much we are copying this foreign system and everything, most black women now are wearing wigs. They're wearing mm. fake makeups. They're wearing eyelashes and mm. all of those things. Mm -hmm. Fine, it's good to look good and all of those things. But then, what happened to your natural African hair? Mm. Personally, I have a determination to really, really hang out with black women who have natural hair. That's my personal proposition. If you notice, yeah. most of it's, it's deliberate. Mm. That's what I do. For me, because I believe that as a black woman, once you're confident enough to walk around with your natural hair, it means you have self-confidence. Mm. Most black women, they might crucify me, but that's the truth of how I see it. 
most black women who are I'm not maybe once in a while we wear wigs, but it shouldn't you mean be most Ghanaians or most Africans on most the continent. African, yeah, most Africans. I mean yeah, they're most, wearing wigs a lot. Not just Africans, most in this hot weather. <laughs> Just, God, I mean, the supreme being gave you natural hair for a reason. You are not supposed to wear the white long, white man's long straight hair as a black woman. So those are some of the things we keep copying wrongly. So for me, I believe that um, there's a need to empower the black woman in Africa more. Mm. And starting with your hair, it, it might look like you should wear your natural hair and show an amount of confidence. So much so that we started um, a natural hair product for African women mm. called Bibini. I see. Bibini? Bibini. Okay. That's, that's how much I believe in the natural African woman, especially with the hair. Mm. You don't have to have long hair. It could be short, whatever. But then, as long as you're not trying to... Have you ever seen a Chinese woman wearing um, a Caucasian wig? Well, now they are, they are turning... Sometimes they, are, they do that. They are, no, now they are doing afro now. now they, yes. I swear, in afro. China. Yes. The what? Truth? Yes. But Chinese but people now are, are wearing afro, afro now in yes. China. You know, it's so, recent though. It's yeah, funny, it's funny because when I was in Bulgaria, there's there's a lot of you know, Caucasian males that are wearing do rags, and yeah. the, and they're braiding their hair, and yeah. they're braiding their hair. Yeah, so, yeah. Some actually doing yeah. dreads. And, that, yeah. that shows how powerful our culture is. It, it, so so why, why why are you trying to wipe out your own <laughs> culture? I, I will say this. I'll say this in defense of, of some black women out there. I understand to a certain degree the wig thing sometimes because mm. when you are now working in the workplace. It's hard sometimes Listen. for them to get their hair done. As this, I'm only saying this because mm. I, you have hair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long you had your hair before you locked it, but I had hair that was just out, you know? And yeah. I ended up cutting it because to get somebody to braid my hair all the time was very difficult. To get it to look good all the time was, when I'm busy, it's hard. So I understand some, mm -hmm. what, I, what I would say is the use of wigs, I can understand at times. The hatred for wearing your own hair is the problem. Mm. If you think that wigs look better or straight hair looks better than your natural hair, that's what I think the problem is. More mm. so than just wearing a wig. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah and I mean, <laughs> let's not digress, man. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> if, if it's not easy to keep your hair, then mm. you probably wear a scarf or something. Mm. Right? Or you cut it. Yeah, but in the workplace. You know, you know, now that's what that's my challenge. You, you what you want you work because you work in. Is it working? Because yeah. you because. Yeah, because you work in um, in a place where you feel ashamed to wear your natural hair because there are other Caucasians there, and then what you're going to wear a wig. What the f are you ashamed of yourself? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand mm, it. Interesting. So interesting. for me, I mean, mm. now this is what it is. As black women, we try to provide on everything. And then, I mean, I'm not saying everybody should do this. Once in a while, a girl come, oh, I want to buy a wig. I don't buy wigs for girls, bro. <laughs> <laughs> do, do, I don't do buy wigs for girls, bro. Do, 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 do I mean, you buy anything for girls? Yes, actually, okay, I do. Okay, okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm actually, I'm an enthusiast for black women hair. So mm. I would probably give you money to braid. Mm. But, but then, braid is cheap. They wouldn't need, they wouldn't need money not, for not, that. It's not about the price. It's about being nice and well mm. put together so it could be a braid mm. it could be something with your natural hair i could mm. buy you natural hair cream but buy you wig i wouldn't do that mm. Mm. i might not tell you straight up but then i would never buy you wig to look occasion mm. be proud of who you are be I proud see. of your hair bars bars all right this has i never expected this <laughs> this conversation is really fire i'm enjoying this we should probably do this once a week yeah, but then, yeah. as you said, I'm diaspora, so I'll probably not be here in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's been an amazing, amazing conversation. Um, if you guys enjoyed it and you want us to do more of these, comment down below. Uh, we'll find a name for this, actually. The Gentleman's the Club. The Gentleman's Table. The Gentleman's Table. The Gentleman's Table. The Gentleman's Table is there. Yeah. All right, so um, if you guys do have any kind of final message or any last words to the people watching, what would it be? Don't wear wigs. Say, look at your own culture. If you're black, yeah, African, yeah. et cetera, I think the bottom line across everything we talked about today is that appreciate, love, value, and adopt your own culture. Mm. If you don't know your own culture, if you're American or diaspora, learn your own culture. If you don't know where you're from, 
pick one. There's mm. 52 plus yeah, places in actually, Africa. Pick one, one. of them. And, and, and you'll be go, accepted, and actually. Them. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Go learn about it. And if you're African, you know, just because you, you can be Christian or is Muslim or you want to, but learn to have respect for your own traditional practices, your traditional spirituality. Learn about it. If you don't know, if you know more about uh, somebody else's culture and religion and spirituality than you know of your own, then that's a problem. Mm. That's a problem. So mm. I would say that that's the, the thing I would leave most with is mm. have love for your own culture. I like that. Imano? Yeah, I mean... As a black person, you're a god. You are so called. You're a god. A god, okay. Yeah. Mm. So just believe in yourself and um, you don't need to overcompensate for who you are. Mm. You are black and proud. That's simple as that. Mm. Yeah. I like that. Van Dross. Yeah, I, I don't have much but just peace, love, happiness. And yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all I got. <laughs> And like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where we're currently, where we are currently filming is called Gender Place. Uh, it's a co-working space located here in East Legon. Um, if you're working, you know, remotely and you want somewhere to plug and play, this is a place for you. Link in description. Check it out. All right. So without further ado, let's just say bye bye to the people watching. All right. Peace. Peace. Peace.